looking for Graham Lester George. The problem comes with a Philip Larkin poem, and it's all down to a so-called friend of his. My friend Alan has got a lot to answer for. It was he who messed up the wits and weddings for me. I've always loved that poem, and whenever it gets requested on Poetry Please or such like, I'll tell the kids to shut up or I'll go into a different room and switch on another radio so that I can listen to it in peace. I like the rhythm of it and the way Philip Larkin conjures up the atmosphere of a proper corridor train in the late 50s with a real steam engine at the front. And no, I'm not an anorak, nor am I some old buffer who gets all misty-eyed about the past. On the contrary, I look back with great longing to a time before nostalgia was so popular. I've discussed it with Alan, and we largely agree about the poem, but there's one line that he doesn't like. It's from the last verse, and it's Bright Knots of Rail. And as we raced across, bright knots of rail, past standing pullmans, walls of blackened moss... We were talking about it in the pub one night, and he told me that that line really bugged him. He said, how can steel railway lines have knots in them? I told him he was being too literal, but he wouldn't have it. No, he said, it just doesn't work poetically. I didn't agree with him, and I said so, and we moved on to other topics. But because he's an English teacher and no mean poet himself, I suppose I must have given his remarks more credence than I thought I had. The very next time it was read out on the radio, I was cooking, I think. I shooed everyone out of the kitchen and settled down to slicing peppers or whatever and prepared to enjoy the poem. Usually they get some almost famous actors to read on these programmes, and they usually read really well. When I hear the wits and weddings being read well, it's like a film starts to run in my head, a short and well-edited film of a train journey. It's like I'm there on the platform, waiting for the man in the peak cap to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. I can see that long, almost empty train pulling out from Hull Station with all its windows down on a hot Saturday afternoon. I can smell the smell of the fish docks drifting into the compartment. And it's all that brilliant imagery that conjures up the modern English landscape. Froth floating on canals and greenhouses flashing and all those acres of dismantled cars. And then the deaf little rural touches such as hedges dipping and rising and wide farms and short shadowed cattle. And then there's the snobby way he talks about the wedding parties. He lets us be superior so that we can see the fathers in their broad belts under suits and their seamy foreheads, the loud fat mums and uncles shouting smut. I love it! All those lime greens and lemon yellows and banquet halls up yards, pure genius! And once all the different wedding parties are on board, we puff off towards London at the end of our journey picking up all the suburban images along the way, building plots and poplars casting long shadows over major roads, an Odeon going past, a cooling tower and someone running up to bowl. Wonderful! And London spread out in the sun, its postal districts packed like squares of wheat. But now, at this point, thanks to Alan, I get all tense. I sense doom because I know we're going to crash. We're dashing headlong towards those bright knots of rail. Cut to a close-up of the driver, a look of horror on his face. Cut to the train bumping and wheels jumping and the grinding of steel on steel. And all I can see now is a headline. Poetry disaster at King's Cross. Sometimes I think I'd like to get my hands on a piece of railway line and tie it in a knot round Alan's neck. That was Graham Lester Jota.